know, and this is my beautiful wife, Jackie, otherwise known as Jacqueline Da. Los lindos, right? <laughs> We've been married four years. We've been together 11 years. We have three boys and another boy and boy. Oh. Yes, June. God bless this woman for being able to come up here with, uh, with our baby ready to pop out. <laughs> Uh, we'd actually like to show you our uh, wedding picture when we got married with our family. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> that would have been epic though, right? <laughs> so, um, you see here, this is our family here, obviously me and Jackie. We've got our oldest son, Jaden, on the uh, left. And then our uh, youngest son, Javon, in the center. And our middle child, Sammy, uh, on the right. Uh, the story that we're going to share with you actually has to do with Javon. because this. This wedding day was kind of horrendous. I don't know if you guys have experienced problems on your wedding day. I'm sure everything went perfect, right? <laughs> Not. <laughs> so uh, I, come, I come to my room and we're getting dressed. My mother-in-law is responsible for watching our kids. And so my wife is on the other side of the hotel and all of a sudden I hear this bloody cry, like this death cry. And she comes and then I open my door and I look at her and I say, what's wrong, what's wrong? She said, I can't find Javon. All right, now on the day of my wedding, my child is missing. All right, what do I do? So I'm looking around, looking around, and then all of a sudden I asked my nephew who was with him, and he says, oh, Jovan ran across the street from the hotel that we're at. Oh, all right, now it just took another level. So we've got our whole family in the hotel, and so now our family is split up, looking across the street, looking inside of the hotel. Something tells me, you know, to, to go and check uh, my, my mother-in-law's room. Now, right when I think this idea, I hear my wife coming out of her room on the other side of the hotel. <gasps> no, my son can't be good. No, where's my son? You gotta let me go. We, we're not supposed to see each other before the wedding. I, I wasn't caring at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so I get my way to my mother-in-law's room and I start looking and sure enough, there goes my son hiding behind the bathroom door. My son has this weird phobia about pooping. When he poops, he's got to do it in private, and he doesn't sit down on the toilet, so he hid behind the door so nobody can see him, and just let one loose in his diaper. <laughs> now, meanwhile, I, I, I tell you guys this story because think about the frantic that you experience looking for your child if your child is lost, right? You know, you go frantic, and you're, cra you're going crazy just looking everywhere. Where, where could they be? Where could they be? And in that same way, God is chasing each and every one of us down to have a relationship with us. And that's why we actually picked the um, story of Hosea and Gomer. Because in our, in our story, as far as our marriage, it ties in perfectly with Hosea and Gomer. And the way that God was chasing each, and, each, each of us down in our relationship. Um, so a little bit of history of Hosea and Gomer is, uh, you know, Hosea is a prophet. All right? This is in a time after uh, King David, after all the kings, Solomon. And right now, Israel is doing good. But they're doing so good, they're forgetting about where they came from, the success that God gave them. So everything they have, they're not thanking God. They're going towards other things. They're going towards uh, money. They're going towards idols. They're going towards wine. They're going towards uh, just other things opposite of God. And God is very upset. So Hosea is assigned to show the unconditional love to these people. Even though the Israelites are running away from God, God is still chasing them down in that frantic way. The same time, the same way that I was chasing down Javon, frantically looking for him, just waiting for him to be in my arms. So we want to bring up uh, Hosea chapter 1, verse 2 to start off with. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife before them, and have children before them. For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. You think the word whoredom was used too much there? <laughs> it's, but it's, it's what God is trying to express here. God is trying to express what his people are doing. His people are, are in whoredom. And they're doing everything and everyone else except for getting close to God. So this verse is calling them out for what they're doing with their idols. So this actually brings me to uh, remember the time between me and my wife. You know, I remember the, the night, uh, it was about 2 a.m. 2 a.m. in the morning, and she had gone out for a, a night with drinks. Now, I fell asleep that night, and I woke up at 2 a.m., and she wasn't home yet. And so I started thinking to myself, where's my wife? So I called her, she didn't answer. And then I started calling around to a couple of her friends who I knew she was with. And when I asked her friends, her friends were telling me, 
oh, she should be home by now. So at this point, my heart sunk. Like, oh my gosh, is she dead? Is she in a car accident? You know, what happened? There's drunk drivers in the road. Well, I kept on trying to blow her up. And at this time, her friends were worried for her too. And so now they're calling my phone. And then she finally calls me back. And the mid's calling me back. She says, okay, I'm on my way home. I'm on my way home. Now something inside of me was like, wait a minute, something's not sitting right. Something doesn't sound right here. And so I had suspicions. And those suspicions led me to uh, install this software uh, on her cell phone. And after I installed this software on her phone, it was revealed to me what was truly happening. On the day before Valentine's Day in 2016, I found out that my wife was being unfaithful. When you find that out, when I found that out, I felt like divorce was the only option. It was the only viable option. And in my fit of rage, I kicked her out of the house, bagged up all her clothes, took back the car that I bought for her, and I sold it within a week. And she was gone, and it was just me and the kids at the house. I remember starting to tell all my family, because it wasn't a secret anymore. I told my friends, I told my family, it's done, it's serious, we're getting a divorce, this is it. As much as I wanted to talk about it, I also wanted support for my decision. See, if I told people I'm getting a divorce, then they were gonna hold me accountable. I thought you said you were getting a divorce. I didn't want an opportunity for my marriage. Because I didn't want, I wanted to be biblically supported in my decision to divorce her. And she was unfaithful. And so as the Bible states, if, if a woman is unfaithful, you have every reason to divorce her. And then about a week later, I remember trying to gather my thoughts at a park. And I remember just crying out to God. Because when we got married, we both gave our lives to God. We both got baptized together. And then we were in small groups, just like you guys are now. Home builders, courageous, beautiful. But something obviously was wrong. I cried, God, what did I do wrong? Why are you doing this to me? I blame God for all that was happening and could not understand if I was living so much for God, why he would want me to suffer so much from the hands of the woman that was supposed to love me most. My life was a roller coaster of emotions, a lot of ups and downs. Once I got married, I told myself, I'm not gonna cheat. And once again, I felt myself stand with God. My ways were selfish. I always just thought about how I wanted to feel and how I wanted to be loved. I fell into the trap from the enemy that I put myself in. I was attending small groups and yes, got baptized with Sam after a few months of, be of being married. Although I wasn't ready, I did it for him. I wanted a different life Although I thought I was walking in it, I wasn't. Maybe this was my life, being labeled a cheater. I, I was still filled with a lot of hurt and unforgiveness, and that night, I was unfaithful to my husband, and he found out. I was also hurt. How could I do this to our marriage? He told me to leave, and that he wanted a divorce. I stayed in my mother's house while he and the boys were at home. And that time, I was reaching out to God and contemplating divorce. Maybe he'll be better off without me. Perhaps this had to happen so that I can leave too. Because the mirror is getting hot in here. <laughs> Hosea chapter 3, verse 1 says, And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes and raisins. Remember how we've heard the word whoredom so much about what the people were doing? Now we hear the word love. Four times occur in this verse. But more importantly, is how Hosea is being called to express this love 
in the likeness of God, the way that God is chasing down the Israelites. Hosea is showing us that God is a real example of how to unconditionally love our spouse. An unconditional love that would be a struggle to show given our circumstances now. I grew up in a, with the preference of a mom. I say that because, yes, I knew God, but I didn't have a relationship with my father and mommy. My father was there, but wasn't present in my life. I was a woman with what you would call daddy issues. I carry that into all my relationships. My first relationship was very emotional, verbal, physically abuse that I dealt with for years with him. And he would tell me that he loved me and that he was sorry, just like my dad did when he wasn't there for me. That started my cycle. I then started cheating on all my men and always with someone familiar, like my exes. I was an emotional cheater, yet physically too. But my cheating stemmed from how I felt and how I wanted to be loved if I didn't get in my way. Then I met Sam, and he was a man. So I gave it a try with him. All was good, but I was still missing something, and I always kept coming back. I cheated, then he cheated, and on and on it went. We did this for years and always took each other back. No one knew but my close people. And everyone thought, oh, they're living the best life. Um, he ended his, his cheating ways while I still had one foot in and one foot out. I was living two separate lives for so long, 30 years. I kept telling myself I was happy and that's all that mattered. We started coming to Grace, which his sister and her husband always invited us to. We began attending blended families, was our first, beautiful and courageous, and my small group was there for me every step of the way. We were taking the right steps, he found God, and I was still a mess. And I just didn't realize, God loved me, but I just didn't realize how much just yet. See, I remember at that moment when I was uh, when I was crying to God. After I was crying to God and feeling so much hate to Him for putting me through this, I remember praying to Him, and He then began to walk me through every bit of love that He had shown me, though I didn't deserve it. Remember, she said we had both cheated. We had both cheated. I cheated on my wife too, although I did it before we were married. Does that make? Although I did it before we were married, did that make me any better of a person? No, I'm not any better. But he forgave me. See, I started thinking about how I was the worst out of my mother's children by far. But yet, I was the only one of her children that was able to come to her on her deathbed and say, I'm sorry, and I love you, and goodbye. Or well, the time that I was clearly drunk and intoxicated driving down uh, Manhattan Road off of Waters Avenue. And the cops pull me over. And I've got open containers in the car. They take me out of the car and give me a field sobriety test. And then tell me, okay, son, you can go home on one condition. That you take all the open containers in your car and pour them out. Was that luck? Was that coincidence? I don't think so. See, this was God's grace before I even knew what his grace was. Before we were married, we had problems and lacked commitment to each other. But I now knew all of his grace through his love so much that he would send his only son to die for us so that we can become dead to sin and alive in him. But even after revealing this unconditional love in all of these things to my heart, I still had the nerves of questions what it was that God wanted me to do. Uh, let's put up Hosea 14.4. The Lord says, 
Then I will heal you of your faithlessness. My love will know no bounds, for my anger will be gone forever. His love will give you faith, and his anger is no more. Is it me, or does that sound a lot like uh, Jesus Christ? See, God had a plan for us, and he has a plan for our marriage. It was at that moment everything started to become so vivid and clear as only God could, God could make it. God told me to love your enemies. I started thinking to myself, how can I do that? Love my enemies? Admittedly, my wife had went from being an alliance partner to now being an enemy of mine because she had hurt me so bad in the deepest, most hurtful possible way. I'm like, God, you so crazy right now? I can't love that woman. She is my enemy. I had taken his message and twisted it so I could make myself feel better. But when I got home, something started convicting me and I needed to see what God was talking about. So of course, at this time, I'm a baby in my faith. I reached out to my, 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 my friend who I'm, I think is the best source for Bible knowledge. Google. <laughs> and that's when it pointed me to Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28. But to you who are listening, I say, okay, God, I'm listening. Love your enemies. Oh, man, so you were for real. Do good to those who hate you. Aren't those opposites? Bless those who curse you. Now I know those are opposites. Pray for those who mistreat you. What the heck, God? I invested all this time into making us right. Trying to keep us faithful. Being faithful. But she still did it. She cheats on me. And you want me to pray for her? I thought, okay, I have to pray for the divorce to go smoothly. I'll pray for it to be the end of the home. Just being real with you guys. I'll pray for the kids that they don't have any issues from this. But the last thing on my mind was to pray for her. But then again, remember, he showed me all that love and grace unconditionally. And now he was calling me to be the living example of Christ. See, there's no convincing God to change his mind. So I did what he put on my heart. I dropped to my knees that night in our bedroom. And I prayed for my wife. I remember it was nerve-wracking. And it was almost as if I were doing the most challenging thing in this world. Little did I know it actually was. See, I was putting my pride and ego to the side. I was willing to suffer for the sake of my wife. Coming to know God and who he truly is. See, what I failed to realize was that all this time, I had been trying to work on my marriage by myself. And I did not allow for God to come in and transform me. In this prayer, I felt my wife's pain. That pain that she had for her dad not being present, that pain that she had from all the men that inflicted this pain onto her, cheating on her, abusing her. And I felt it, and it hurt. And it started to put a new perspective for me. I cried for her. And I begged for God to do in a work in her that I know I'm not capable of. I admitted to God that my marriage is a failure without you. If we are meant together, then God, please, show me in your works through my wife. I prayed for her every night going forward until God did speak to me through her. I was scared to get divorced. I knew it was real because this time he told his whole family what I did. While at my mom's, I was reading the Bible and writing in my journal, asking God, to not break my family apart. 
I was up to do anything to make it right. My sister told me about a God encounter that we should attend to. This was my last hope in restoring our marriage. So me and my sister went, and in that weekend, I finally forgave my father. I forgave all the men in my life that I blamed for mine. Oh, for my cheating ways. And most importantly, I forgave myself. And I knew God forgave me. I remember being at that hotel and I was walking towards the elevator. Um, my sister was ahead of me, so I was by myself. There was nobody in the hallway. And I saw a shadow, and it scared me. Um, so I just ran to the staircase. And I remember just walking down the stairs, running down the stairs, literally, that was so scared. And I remember holding, having my right hand open, and I felt Jesus here. Um, holding my hand and I felt peace and I just kept praying Jesus you're there Jesus be with me Jesus be with me and he was and I believe that that shadow was like the old me leaving me um, it was it was beautiful then he took it a step further and in prayer I saw visions of blue Something so beautiful that I, I, I can't understand what he was telling me. And um, I remember sitting down and he, I felt him holding me. And I was like, I felt that peace that I've never felt ever before. And the next day at church, with all the women at service, the pastor gave me the mic and she said, I think you need this. And I was like, what? And a couple of minutes before that, God spoke to me, and he said, and I, 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 I believe that this was the first time he ever spoke to me, and he said, you're going to talk. And I said, I'm going to talk? I can't, I can't talk. I was so nervous. And yeah, she gave me the mic, and I told my testimony in front of the whole service. That weekend, three years ago, I gave my life to Christ. I was renewed. <laughs> renewed. I received the Holy Spirit and began walking my life into living one life, finally, after 30 years. But it's God's timing. And that was the life, and that new life was, was the life that I was living with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And finally realizing that it was only God who could fill that void. That he could only make me happy. No man. I, I, I put Sam through so much. But through God's grace, he made me whole. All along, I knew my husband was praying for me, even though I didn't deserve it. But I felt his prayers. He was lifting me up. And I can say it was one of the reasons I let go and let God in. Sam's love for me was changed because of his relationship with God. He was strong enough to hold us both and to let God's grace take over in our relationship. Through Sam's forgiveness and prayers, I was able to experience God's love and grace for the first time from any man in my life. <laughs> so proud of this woman, y'all. God. See, in our battle with uh, infidelity, in our marriage, forgiveness was vital in us being able to give and receive God's love. The reason we picked out the book of Hosea was to help share our testimony is that it very much portrays what was happening in our marriage. If you guys have anything like this going on in your marriage, I strongly encourage you to read that same book, Hosea, because then you start to really expound on God's love and what he has planned and what we're supposed to reflect. Forgiveness was a huge part of it on my part, but there was also a huge step 
in the form of repentance on my wife's part. Hosea, two, uh, Hosea chapter 2, verse 10. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. So he told me about Hosea and Gomer, and I immediately went to the Bible because I've never heard of them before. So there we were, a story like ours in the Bible. Then he told me the only way that he would take me back is if I got rid of my clothes, my car, my phone. If I came back to him new with the old things gone from my past. I was like, is this man crazy? Get rid of my clothes? I, I, I just couldn't believe it, but I felt him. So I did think about it. And I said, yes. I let go of all my things. And I said yes because of my newfound relationship with God. And I felt like even though this was a big step, I knew this is what needed to happen. I know it sounds crazy, but because God knew if it was the old me, I would have said no. And I remember not having a car for a whole year. And it's not that we couldn't get a car. I don't know, I just didn't care. I, and we had shared a car, right? It was for a whole year. And I remember my father-in-law gifting me a car, an old car, and I was so happy. And I remember even keeping that car for another year, and that was my testimony car. To me, I was happy. We were together, and it's all that mattered. So, but that weekend that I came home before that we went to Orlando. We went to a small shopping street for some clothes because I didn't have anything. <laughs> she wasn't walking around naked, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but when I finally walked home, like I, when I opened that door, I was home with my family. And then that's when our, our relationship building started again. You know that thing she brings up about my dad real quick? is that he didn't forgive her. He was one of the people I told her Jackie cheated on me. He didn't want to talk to her. And then when he found out I forgave her, he couldn't imagine how it happened. But then all of a sudden, that forgiveness just started pouring onto him. Now after this, how does he turn around and give a card to the wife of the son whom she cheated on? Mm. Forgiveness is uh, very much infectious. It's very much contagious. We'd like to actually show you a current picture of our family today. That's our youngest son, Javon, Sammy, Jaden, and then um, baby boy, John Doe. <laughs> we need help with the names. We're between two. After this experience, we have learned to live happily ever after and don't experience any more problems or fights in our marriage. Not. <laughs> our battle with uh, infidelity may be something that you never go through. And I pray to God that that's the case. But infidelity is not the only way that we can experience God's love and grace in our marriages. Forgiveness is key. Is there something that is going on in your marriage that is holding you from taking that next step with God in your marriage? Is it a previous marriage, relationship, daddy issues, mommy issues, that you've been harboring guilt, shame, and lack of forgiveness? Are there bad financial decisions that need to be forgiven? Is it arguments about the kids, responsibilities, in-laws? The, the, the list can go on. You guys got problems. I say these problems, I say these problems not because you guys have the problems. These are problems that we experience in our marriage in addition to infidelity. And we still battle them to this day. Remember the story of my child at the beginning? 
I told you I was, I was frantically looking for Javon. When I found him, he had his diaper full of poop. <laughs> diaper full of poop, it's stunk. He wasn't answering any of my calls. Any of my calls, people screaming out for him. He was still hiding, he didn't care. But when I found him, what do you think the first thing I did was? I hugged him. And I told him I loved him. I was so grateful that my son was back with me in my arms. See, for a lot of us here, we have an easy time forgiving our, our kids. But then you cannot do the same thing for your spouse. My wife and I are evidence and living proof that people can change through the love and grace of God. Yes, Lord. See, what Hosea showed is that, you know, in order to get this love, this forgiveness, as this is happening, it needs to happen here. Because this is the way it gets exemplified. This is the way it gets amplified. This is the way you truly feel that love and grace. God's love is not meant to be an option. It's meant to be the option. We read up a quote uh, from Richard Strauss here. Maybe why don't you read the quote? This is your quote. Go ahead. Only one who knows the love and forgiveness of God can ever love this perfectly. And one who has experienced his love and forgiveness cannot help but love and forgive others. See, once you experience that from here, you don't have the choice anymore from here. If you and your spouse are facing infidelity issues, or you're having problems with forgiveness in other areas of your marriage, we want to let you know there are resources available to you. For us, we actually, we had Christian-based counseling that helped us. We started seeing uh, Dr. Ron Beck. We call him Dr. Ron for short. He's with Tampa Family Resources. And we've also got another couple at Tampa Family Resources who does couple counseling in uh, Brent and Lucy High. And we're gonna have contact information for them on the back table. We have cards where you can reach out to them if you'd like to. But those are not your only resources. Being here at Grace Family Church, you've got resources as pastors. You've got Helena and Pastor Chris. You've got other pastors on staff available to you. But even closer to you than that, look at the couple that's across from the table from you. Look at the couple that's next to you. Look at your table lead. You've got people available to you that want to help, that want to walk in this life with you and help you in anything that you may be experiencing. But we just don't want to sweep another issue under the rug. Right now, we'd like to pray for you guys and your marriages. Forgiveness in your marriage as we close out. Dear Father God, I just, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity for allowing me and my wife to step foot out in your kingdom, Father God, for your glory, for your praise, and allow us to share our testimony, Lord. Lord, may our testimony have reached the hearts here in this audience, Lord. Lord, if, if anyone is experiencing this issue or feeling convicted today, whether it's in their relationship at home with their spouse, whether it's in their relationship with God, whether it's in a relationship with their kids, whether it's any relationship at all with, with their father that may be harboring them in their marriage, Father God, I just ask that they give it to you. I ask that they utilize the resources that you have provided to them, Lord. Lord, I just pray, I pray for the future of the marriages in this room, Father God. Lord, I know they've taken a step out in faith by just coming here tonight. And I know that they're here in your presence, Father God. So, Lord, I just pray that they open up their hearts to feel your presence. Lord, I know you're frantically chasing each and every one of us down. So, Lord, let them stop running. Let's stop running right now, Lord. And let's turn around and face you. Let's bring you into the center of our marriages. Let's change what the world says our marriage is supposed to be. It's not just a piece of paper, Father God. It's a covenant with you. 
It's an honor to be married, and it's an honor to be married in your son's mighty name. Lord, we just love you and praise you, and I lift up these couples. If they're having these hard times, if they're going through this tough time, Lord, that they can be transparent, that they can come and talk to us, they can talk to pastors, they can talk to the people at their tables. Lord, may the resources be readily available, and may their hearts be ready to be poured into and be ready to pour out. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you.